In the beginning, the innocent athletes of the 20s and 30s didn't know what follies were. They just took weird shots and wore strange clothing, and so we laugh at them today. But by the 40s, they were actually trying to entertain and amuse, as each sport developed its own distinctive folly style. In the 50s, giants of the genre emerged, and interest in sports humor exploded. The 60s and 70s saw a rogues gallery of colorful characters humanize the follies. Soon, we were plunging headlong into the 80s. Today, big league athletes can pull off a sensational stab, then make a fabulous faux pas. Somehow, that's so reassuring to all the rest of us. Only someone this good can commit the greatest sports follies. Uh, sometimes we're very serious about what we're doing. But when you look back at it, you say, boy, that was, uh, that was seriously funny. <laughs> Mr. Borg's shot strikes the official, knocking his glasses to the ground. How unfortunate. And they are about to make a decision, and this could be a momentous decision. That you remember that? Oh, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. They did that to Ivan Munson. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Myra straight back to pass. Looking. Now stops, throws, completes it to Kilmer up at the 30 yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. And he's running it into the end zone the wrong way. Thinks he scored a touchdown. He has scored a safety. As Jim Marshall knows, strange things happen in the NFL. That's the fun that attracted a child of the 50s named Jerry Glanville. <laughs> I've never gotten out of bed where I don't want to run in and go to work. And when you have that feeling that there's no drudgery, that you, you just can't wait to get there, then uh, my philosophy is uh, if you really don't have a job, you have some part of your life that you enjoy doing. You catching on? Yeah, I think so. You think so? Where'd you go to school? Huh? Where'd you go to school? Iowa. What, in Iowa State? No, we got no, the wrong guy. We were no. drafted. We won the Iowa State quarterback. <laughs> we took the wrong guy. Coach. <laughs> Coach Sherman. He went to Iowa. I, know it. I wanted the Iowa State quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the wrong guy. I tell you, that happens in the draft. End up with the wrong guy. Sometimes you get the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
other times you pick the wrong play. Sometimes the wrong guy picks the wrong play, but it ends up in the right place. Gets up and now cranks up, throws a deep bomb to Butler. He's got it. You just never know, because that dang ball won't bounce the same way twice. Really, the ball probably originally wasn't designed to do what we're doing with it now. I guess if the ball was round, we couldn't, we wouldn't have all this fun. The Houston Oilers keep coming up smelling like a rose, thanks to their happy-go-lucky coach and a fairly sizable home field advantage. Probably our biggest advantage uh, in the Dome is uh, we have giant Texas cockroaches. We have cockroaches in the visitor's locker room that I've heard players say they have ridden them out to the bus. This has to be an advantage because if you're from the North, you don't get to see these things. I mean, these, these are the size of alligators. <laughs> Each NFL stadium has its own little surprise for visitors. Magnets in the turf at Seattle. Old Testament interlopers in Atlanta. Landfill leftovers in New York. California's La Brea tar pits. Arctic Circle antics in Green Bay. Thin air in Denver. And hound of the Baskervilles weather in Chicago. I say, old chap, did you say a game was being contested at Soldier's Field today? Without my bifocals, I can't quite make out the pitch. Here's how it looks to us, and we're only about... 20 yards away from the play. We can hardly see it. In the stands, the fans can't. And they're relying on the play-by-play -play announcer to keep them abreast of what's going on. Cunningham looking. He fires the pass. And it is... It may be intercepted by the Bears. Sometimes Mother Nature gives these play-by-play -play types a good excuse for blowing a call. But what's their problem when the sun's out? Miller going to hand it to Primus. Primus, five, ten, twelve, lefty, seventeen, ten, six, five, touchdown, Primus in the corner. Other times, they just don't believe they saw what they saw. And he spent over the top, stays on his feet. To the 40, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, and he scored. I don't believe it. Hey, yo. All this high-flying football makes Jerry Glanville smile. But you gotta go back about 30 years to make his heart really skip a beat, you know? To Jerry from Elvis, thanks for the tickets. <laughs> He's not dead. He's alive. <laughs> yeah, Jerry still hangs out with Elvis and drives James Dean's car. Sure James Dean's in the trunk. <laughs> Now, we can take the mill out of this car and make 150 Toyotas. <laughs> that you'll never see uh, Coach Glanville on the downbeat. Well, the Oilers, they, they play a wide open game, you know. They, uh, whenever it comes time for them to do something, they uh, jump on and go with it. The King approves of the Oilers' wide open style, and the players all march to the beat of a different drummer. That drummer is a coach who actually enjoys his team's contribution to the volleys. His eye was on the ball here. It's his hands that weren't working. I'm looking for my favorite play. Is this hit the Jets yeah. kick? This is my favorite play of all last year. In fact, I've asked to, uh, for the Jet film to make a copy of this for me. This I love. We call this a, a West Coast weed.
The New York Jets set an unofficial world record for a number of laterals, yards traveled, and elapsed time on this play. But you know what they say. Those who live by the West Coast weave die by the West Coast weave. You see, record-making, breathtaking, game-breaking plays are always just one oops away from a folly. Fans love them, but for coaches and players, there's only one thing worse. Way up here. Official. He's up here, sir. Come on, you see 88 holding out there. God, what you going to do, stand there and let him hold? Hey, the ball hadn't been kicked. Yeah, we have a good conversation going on with most of these people, and uh, I think uh, we look forward to seeing them, and uh, they look forward to having a little conversation with us each Sunday. You are a liar. You're a big liar. You are a liar, Earl. You are a liar. I throw two balls, and all of a sudden, you're going to call the other one. That other pitch won the strike. Where's he allowed to go? He cannot go. He may avoid the tag. Yeah, he can get around him. How that's three holding penalties on one football team in a quarter and a half. That ain't funny. No, 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 no. You gotta use your judgment on it. I understand. No, one, two. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has their own style of communicating with officials. Head coach John Cheney of the Temple Owls only has to establish eye contact. But in the last couple of years, the rules have changed. We're not able to talk to the officials anymore. So now I'm guilty of just staring at them once in a while. They've called a couple of my stares the one-eyed jack stare. But we can't talk to them, so at least I can stare at you. John, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to meet in an alley because he because I'll be stares at you with those big eyes and and, and I would just drop over and play dead because he was scared the heck out of me. And he wants a team of domination. That's it. Not competitiveness, domination. That's John. The other coaches, they're worse than I am. <laughs> At least I think they are. <laughs> Especially that Roly. <laughs> Roly and, and Speedy, yeah, they're, they're bad boys. <laughs> My personality is somewhat of a quiet personality. I mean, I'm an emotional kind of a guy. Uh, being the nationality that I am, it, it, it causes that. I think I have a pretty good relationship with the officials. Um, and now they're not supposed to talk, but we still have a little camaraderie and a little conversation now and then. I love to look at him more than I see the game. In fact, when I'm scouting them, I lose sight of their team and watch Rowley. He's, uh, he's really uh, something very funny. Speedy the same way. Speedy Morris, oh, he, gets, he wrestles with himself. You know, he tears himself apart. And I mean, he takes off his clothes as he's yelling and screaming. Speedy is a sight to behold, I think. There's Speedy Morris. He is going to be losing that tie shortly, and the sweater is probably in deep trouble, too. And Speedy Morris, who ripped his pants here two years ago, they were threatening to rip his sweater off. This reminds me of two years ago, and Speedy ripped his pants right up the back. I ripped him because I, I was wearing 36 pants, and I, I got about 39 waist, you know, and uh, I, I learned since then to get buy bigger pants, and I just uh, expanded too much for the pants, and, and they couldn't take any more. They had enough, and they just popped. <laughs> The fans saw it. I mean, it wasn't just a little tear. I was just happy I had clean underwear on. And of course, when he went into halftime, his wife was throwing his pants up and he was standing there coaching in his underwear. <laughs> and he still won the game. That's why I told him, split them every time you play. I said, you're better off. If they give you a W, that's all it takes. These three coaches all work in the same building. Philadelphia's Palestra is the home court of a unique city series called the Big Five. 
Each year, Temple, LaSalle, St. Joseph's, Villanova, and Pennsylvania display Division I college basketball at its best. So that fire is always burning. You don't have to come out with any great new Rockney speeches. Not at all. It's always uh, uh, a fire that's already there to win the big five. <laughs> and here's Gary from Long Range. Whoa, three on one. Williams up again and he's going to be blocked. Rodney Williams. There's a tough one. Quincy with a pop. Oh, oh, five minutes left in the two point ball game. Comes Presley, three on one. Presley from the clay. <laughs> Massey, oh my! Here comes a party. But all this emotion can sometimes backfire. Oh, he walked. He walked. The crowd intimidated him, I think. And he was trying to think of about eight different moves and couldn't get any of them correct. We put all of the time and teaching and coaching to get that ball right through that basket, and yet it seems to bounce everywhere. He undunked. So he undunked the ball instead of dunking the ball. <laughs> Sometimes we say it's a brick. He shot up a brick. <laughs> and uh, it's being kicked around everywhere. You go to try to pick the ball up, and there's one guy who misses it, and two other guys fall on the floor. This guy dies at it, he misses it, and another guy ends up with it. The ball's going that way, and all of a sudden it's going back this way by the other team, and he goes down and blows the basket. Ball hits him in the face, he falls out. All these things happen, and, and, it, and it's very funny. But it just goes to show you that uh, the game is not so far removed from where life is. As in life, we sometimes foul up and a buddy saves us. Or we might get stuck in an awkward situation. There are days when we run out of room or want to leave early. But most of all, everybody needs somebody to hold on to when life gets rough, as it surely will. been in hockey for so many years now and every year has been fun. Um, to me, when the fun does go out of it, I think it's time to get out of it. <laughs> Terry Crisp is a former Broad Street bully from the Philadelphia Flyers who now presides over the loosest team in the NHL, the Calgary Flames. <laughs> Just don't think, react. <laughs> be all right. We all went with uh, visions of grandeur and doing this and that, but what it really is, if you jump up on top of Secretariat, you know you got a pretty good chance of finishing up in the top money. Here's Poplinski. Watson gives it to Radina. He shoots. Land for the save. Oh, they put it in. Joseph. 
Johnson packed it back into his own net, and it is five to three Calgary. John, man, that plow horse, you better be gouging pretty good to get down the home stretch. Two on three, Muller in the middle. The shot was deflected on goal. Terry is the kind of guy that uh, says uh, what he feels and says it loudly and says it right away. So at times he's uh, he's very boisterous and sometimes even out of control. But the bottom line is he wants to win hockey games and, and that's what we're all here for. Well, in the 16 years I've gone through just about every kind of coach you can imagine. Uh, coach Crisp is, is kind of a hauler guy. It's uh, his way or the highway sort of deal. He wants you to play with emotion out there and, and go that way. They're all men, they're family men, they're human beings, and we're going to make mistakes. And if we make mistakes, and you can look at the lighter side of making that mistake, you don't go bonkers. You don't rock wind the rubber band up and it goes boing. It's not always serious out here, and if you don't have fun with it, uh, you won't last very long. Well, something funny just happened. Dave Maley put on Manson's helmet as he's skating off the ice. He did. He thought he had his own helmet, tucked it on, and was skating off. <laughs> After you've had a few days to watch it, and it's not life or death, you do find some humor in it. Maybe not that given time. It depends on whose bull is being gored as to it's humorous or not. I think that, uh, that you gotta have a sense of humor to play in this game, and there's a lot of funny things that happen during games. But sometimes it's fun, sometimes it isn't fun. He centers it on the of that. There's nobody there, there's a loose stick, and there's a loose glove, and the glove scores! <laughs> Fellas, this is hardly the time of the place, you know? Come on, fellas, please, just knock it off, okay? Come on, come on, guys. Take that, eh? Hoser. So, I'll tell you, that green seat and the white seat, if there happened to have been people sitting there, well, the people in the first row are holding up to that guy. Some draws. And here, Bergeron will be going right now. I can't believe it. Uh, pucks end up in the darndest places. It's in the skate of Salming. It got lodged actually right in the... Now, there's the first. Call Ripley. I've never seen that one. Hopefully not too many people get hurt. A lot of the players you watch in the Follies have done something pretty good just to get there. Shot. Trickles near the goal line, and it's brushed along and out front. The skill was just even get there to make the folly to begin with. The folly is the end result of trying to make a heck of a play. shot now you can see how he puts it in the corner now watch this puck hump the board it looks like it's going to stay there all the way it's magnetized the goalie thinks it's coming back behind but he's wrong it's a score life's not just a bowl of cherries every time you just can't have fun every day because sometimes we're going to hit some pitfalls along the way but if by and large you're having fun you're enjoying your sport you're enjoying your teammates hang in there keep doing it because the fun days far outnumber the miserable days. Believe me, they do. And too soon, too fast, 
They leave us, they're gone, and you can't get them back. Terry Crisp and his Calgary Flames have demonstrated that the right blend of fun and games can take a team straight to the top. Lanny McDonald shoots, he scores! The old man has come through! The Flames are ahead 2-1 in the Stanley Cup final! In 1989, the Flames followed the lighthearted lead of their bushy-faced elder statesman and curly-headed coach to the World Championship and a nice little trophy they call the Stanley Cup. So you say you don't have the studs to win a championship. Today, I will teach you how to win with your brain. Dr. Freud called it a psych job, and it starts with eye contact. Sometimes, all it takes is a subtle glance, or a little body language will send the message. Did you get the message, Mookie? Al Rabowski was my favorite subject of all time. Here was a man who could communicate his deepest feelings without speaking. Rabowski was called the Mad Hungarian, but he was nothing compared to tennis pro Ilina Stase, a Romanian known as Dracula. Hey, loosen up, Ely! I don't know. I, I'll, I'll loosen up. I'll loosen up right now because I'm tense right now. <sighs> As a touring professional, Ely Nastasi was the loosest player to ever grace a court. In a game marked by somber intensity, Ely was a child at play. He was a gifted athlete and brilliant shot maker who was at one time ranked in the world's top 10, but he simply couldn't resist his natural temptation to have some fun. Often he flashed back to boyhood memories of soccer in his native Romania. His attention span was short and he frequently lapsed into a fantasy land fueled by his own fervid imagination, initiating dialogue with the ball, his racket and himself. But his mood swings were not always sunny. He could suddenly turn as dark and menacing as a Bucharest winter. At these times, he became nasty Nastasi. Intimidating officials. Disturbing opponents. And shocking fans. This talented and temperamental artist was unlike anything the tennis world had ever seen. Depending on your point of view, that was either good or bad, but never indifferent. Sure, sometimes I went too far. And I have to admit it, but uh, I don't regret it. But I don't regret at all, because it was me. I did it my way, like, you know, Sinatra did it. Today, Ely is a touring pro, still teaching his unconventional style at a Paris tennis club, owned by his old Romanian doubles partner, Jan Teriak. Did, did you teach him? No, not really. I mean, uh, he was so gifted that uh, he was gifted from God. And then uh, I was the second one, so I never compare myself with God, but <laughs> he was probably the most gifted tennis player I saw in my 30 years. And... Uh, I don't believe that uh, players like this are coming every generation and uh, the man uh, had a merit to change the game of tennis from tennis sport to entertainment. And that uh, my young friend uh, was, uh, he's not so young anymore, uh, no. still unfortunately has the bad habits, uh, the <laughs> hair is as long as he was. A young Ely emerged on the international scene in the 60s as a member of the Romanian Davis Cup team, led by his Svengali, Jan Teriak. The prodigy was taking graduate classes in Intimidation 101 from Professor Teriak. So when he came along, uh, not really only coaching him, but I was always older. Now we change, he's older than I am. 
But uh, at that time, uh, I take it, I take them with me, and uh, we form uh, the first uh, odd couple of the tennis. Put it that way. Impressionable Ely learned his lessons well and graduated with honors. He was soon taking the nasty Nastasi show on the road to tennis clubs all over the world. These guys are terrible. The tournament was ruined for me and the tenseness and the problems I had with my friend, Mr. Nastasi, who caused a lot of trouble in every match that he played this week. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You know, they talk about Nastasi being the victim of all this. Think about the guys that lost to him because of it. So, you say this nasty Nastasi fellow from Bucharest is rude and boorish. Maybe so, but he's also very entertaining. So long as you don't have to play him, that is. Ely even played some head games with his former partner, Jan Teriak, who was now retired and coaching Guillermo Vilas. To circumvent rules against coaching during a match, Vilas would look for discreet hand signals from Teriak in the stands. So Teriak, uh, before the match, was talking to Vilas in, uh, with the signs, you know, they're just saying if I put my finger, I know, up in my eye, I don't know. So I was playing Vilas in the French Open a couple of years ago. And he was saying from the other side of the court, and I was in this, and Teriak was behind me. So I knew Teriak was going to do something, so I just put my, my head between my legs and I tell Teriak, no coaching. For better or worse, Nastasi influenced a whole new breed of tennis player who arrived on the scene as he was leaving, bequeathing the game a personality and sense of humor it had previously lacked. Nastasi never worked. He played the game. I did have fun. I, you know, it's, uh, every time I was playing the court, I have fun. I mean, uh, losing or winning, I have matches that I like it, but I lose the match. And that's the way I was. In the world of sport, there are precious few originals. Ely Nastasi was one of the greatest. Well, Nastasi's uh, colorful counterparts can be found in every sport. But baseball breeds more of these odd fellows than anywhere else. Why? Because they have so much free time on their hands, that's why. Larry Anderson is a well-traveled middle reliever who keeps assuming new identities. That's me. I'm Nolan Ryan. Last year, gave up a home run to Schmidt in the Dome. And it was pretty much a blast. And Hal Lanier came out to the mound. He said, uh, looked at me and kind of shook his head. He says, anything hit that high and that far ought to have a stewardess and an in-flight movie. <laughs> I thought that was comforting. I'm not about to put baseball above life. And I think that's, you know, the things I do is part of my life. Even when he was with the Phillies, Anderson has always been strange. Sort of like Pittsburgh's Andy Van Slyke, whose off-center ideas led to the nickname Norman, as in Norman Bates of Psycho. Baseball players, I think, have uh have fun in any condition, no matter what it is, and especially when it, when it comes to the snow and rain, because when you make a mistake on the field and, uh, and 50,000 people see it, um, you better have a sense of humor, because if you don't, you're gonna end up uh, checking into the base motel pretty soon. 
Today is April 8th. We're in Wrigley Field, Chicago. And this is the pirate trio of the Pittsburgh Pirates, even though there's more than three. Okay, guys? Ready? Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. One, two, one, two, three. The weather outside is frightful. And I am so delightful. I don't want to play. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Boys of summer know how to weather the storm, but their environment is never completely under control. Blimps blot out the sun. Runaway rainbirds jump the gun. I'm not a meteorologist. Don't tap my foot and ask me if it's going to rain or not. Check the wind direction. We had just taken the lead. We're trying to get the, get the last three outs of the game. All of a sudden, this wind starts picking up. Uh, the skies turn black. Our catcher is being invaded by uh, hot dog papers and, and Cokes and beer cups. And all of a sudden, he's getting plastered. It was the first time that I, I've ever had a wind delay in any of my years in, in baseball. The animal kingdom is also part of Mother Nature's plan to make each fly ball a safari. Another breaking ball, sky to left. It hit a bird! You it hit a bird! That? I have never seen that! That bird. ball is a bird flying in the air and dropped it. I've never seen a base hit like that in my life. I don't know what it is about baseball, Major League Baseball, but it, there's something about the game that attracts animals. You got squirrels running around the field. You got cats, birds, bugs. They get down the field and they get in your eyes and they get in your ear. And I was running after the ball one time and with my mouth open and bingo. Here comes the mouth flying right into my throat, end up swallowing it. And I end up almost dropping the ball and nobody knows it. And now I'm the only guy who ends up almost being the goat because of a moth. <laughs> a ball soars through the night sky. Mr. Andrew Van Slyke of the Pittsburgh Pirates intersects the hurling sphere an instant before it plunges to earth. The skill has earned Mr. Van Slyke a gold glove, yet he knows at any given moment he can enter another dimension of time and space known as the Follies Zone. things can happen positively and negatively and that player it goes through a player's mind when he has too much time to think when he's sitting there camp under a ball he's he knows that there's two outs and the base runners are running around the bases trying to get the home and he's waiting he's waiting he's backing up he's backing up he's waiting he goes i got it i got it and flank and hits his glove he drops it and in the back of his mind he almost knows hey i I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. Why did it have to happen? He's caught the ball 99 out of 100 times before the ball was hit. And he knows that, ah, I probably got it. But that one time, he's waiting, he's waiting, and clank. I say, old chap, where does one develop the skill necessary to join the Order of the Iron Glove? Why, in spring training, of course. Ah. I don't think this does anything for you at all. Let's stretch it. <laughs> Hey, Norton! Hey! Spring training is, is the time for suntans. It's not like we're doing a Jane Fonda tape and, and trying to get ourselves uh, our bust line uh, down or up or our butts up or down or thighs in or out. I mean, that's that's not what we're thinking about. Uh, every day I would come in and, and uh, boast about how 
how well I was catching bass in spring you training. And that's all I thought about when I was on the field in spring training. <laughs> <laughs> Those who survive fishing trips in Florida earn a spot on the traveling squad. That's smart. On the surface, this game seems so rudimentary. Simply proceed to each base in sequence, stopping only when necessary. Is he going to steal first? He steals first. Now he's going to steal second again. I've never seen it before. <laughs> Where's Evan Casella when you need it? Such a basic task. Strike a leather-bound ball of twine with a sturdy stick of wood. Field. This ball is deep. This ball's out of here. I can't believe that. Somebody better check that bat. Oh, yes, and don't forget to bring along your sense of humor. I think the players uh, can almost become a fan. They almost are sitting in the stands themselves with that coke and, and watching that happen, and, and uh, they're laughing along with the fans, which makes it real funny. It's not a setup. It just happens, and it, and it happens to be a funny thing. Swing and a ground ball back at the mound. Off the glove, hits Kipper in the head. He tries to recover. He throws safe at first base. Here it is again. Deion James hits a ground ball. It first goes off his glove, then off his head. In his haste to try to make the play, he loses his cap. Knowing Andy Van Slyke, Slick will have something to say to Kipper about this when they look at it again. Trying to duplicate uh, one hop hoppers off the face is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of work, practice. He said the thing I need to work on is the cap flying off my head a little bit better. And that's just the way I approach it. You got to have fun. To me, I don't know how you cannot have fun at, at, at this level. I mean, you're playing in the big leagues. It's something that, that uh, you've always wanted to do. If you can't have fun here, I, I'm certainly, I'm convinced you're not going to have fun when you're pumping gas when you're out of base, if I can tell you that. Fun and games. That's what sport is all about at any level. Perhaps we can sum this all up by paraphrasing the most famous quote from the sports cliche Hall of Fame. It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you make the greatest sports follies that counts.